questions that we're going to be talking about today. Well, the other girls were dressing up in, in, in corsets that she had to wear pants. She was really a, a woman's leader, a leader amongst women. She never married, uh, never had any children. Then she finds this community of women who also say, we also don't want to get married, and we just want to live with other, with other women. You know, she lives most of her life um, with, with a really what we'll call today her best friend, um, who, who was a woman, but more than anything, was really a friend. Um, <coughs> She writes in a letter, she opens it in front of me. I, I love when you do that thing with your knee. There's no doubt talking about how she would have clean the belt. I think we should let the other girls in on this. <laughs> and, and that's when she opens up her, her boarding house. Just for other women who like themselves, maybe feel like they're more on the outside of society. Always two to a room, that was the rule, two to a room. I think we may have to be careful for, for, for starting to think that perhaps isn't more romantic. It's a uh, modern tendency. <laughs> really, that intimacy came out of the French. There's such a pressure to want to name her as being gay. They didn't use that language back then except of course being happy. And I think she was happy and gay in that sense. This isn't strange for two women to care and love each other, to have this friendship ceremony when they exchange rings, um, and to move in together and live only with other women. Great. So I think that sets the stage very well for this talk. Um, let's see if I can let the slides advance. Yeah, okay, great. Well, we'll leave it there for now. So I imagine some of you will have previously encountered versions of that meme, which circulates pretty widely on social media. And the message of the meme formula, the kind of historians will say they were just good friends formula, is that historians are this external and perhaps slightly villainous force dedicated to erasing the reality of queer history. While the speaker in the sort of meme or the video like that one um, and the presumed queer viewer, not professional historians, are united in their shared understanding that they are uncovering the queer truth that historians have sought to hide. And when I first started to notice these memes a couple of years ago, I felt a bit attacked. Uh, I'm an academic historian, and my research and teaching tend to focus on telling complicated, nuanced, and often politically unsatisfying stories about the queer past. So am I historians? Is this what my students think about my teaching? But I was also intrigued because this meme makes some interesting claims about the nature of expertise, about the nature of research and teaching in academic history, about who gets to tell and to claim ownership over certain kinds of narratives about the past, and about how we can and should interpret the lives of people who lived in different times and places. More than 30 years ago, what was then called lesbian and gay history was ribbon with something that we academic historians call the transhistoricist social constructionist debate. Um, lesbian and gay historians, the vast majority of whom identified as lesbian and gay themselves, disagreed vociferously about whether it was politically important to establish connections between people in the past and present day lesbians and gay men, or whether it was more important to understand on their own terms the social and cultural contexts in which people in the past lived, in which sexual orientation as such wasn't a part of how people understood their own identities or how society was organized. And the upshot of this debate was that we academic historians reached a kind of compromise middle ground, though social constructionism mostly went out. But I think the historians will say they were just good friends meme indicates that lots of up and coming would be queer historians working outside the academy are demonstrating a renewed interest in the trans historicist position, right? In that sort of claiming as gay, uh, people who didn't necessarily name themselves as such. And what does this mean? And how do we know whether two people were in a relationship, loved one another, or had sex? What can and can't archival documents tell us? And how important are those questions actually to what it means to practice queer history in the academy today? So in this talk, I'd like to invite us to think through these questions together, through the prism of the lives of some women who feature in the book that I'm currently writing about gender and British higher education in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, so these are they. Um, Marjorie Fry, Rose Sidgwick, and Marjorie Rackstraw were women academics and university administrators who pursued careers in Britain in the first decades of the 20th century. In a historical moment in which it was unthinkable and sometimes structurally impossible for a middle-class woman both to marry and to pursue a professional career, Fry, Sidgwick, and Rackstraw all lived lives by definition opposed to opposite-sex marriage, reproduction, and the nuclear family. 
They also lived in a particular historical moment when the understanding of what intimacy between women meant was especially in flux. The category lesbian was available to them. Indeed, they lived at a time when the hetero-homo binary was becoming increasingly stable and hegemonic as a framework for distinguishing normal from abnormal behavior, especially for women. But there is no evidence that any of them ever used that word to understand themselves. All of them understood themselves as spinsters, as single women. But to what extent was a life lived outside marriage and reproduction choice? And to what extent was it circumstance, a byproduct of the decision to put career first? How can we understand what Fry, Sidgwick, and Rackstrom meant to each other, and to the other important people in their lives, in terms that would have made sense to them? And what do their lives tell us about queer history, and what it means for academic historians like me to research and tell queer stories? So I'm going to start by telling you the story of Fry, Sidgwick, and Rackstrom's overlapping lives, focusing particularly on the time that they all spent together working at the University of Birmingham and living as resident faculty in the Women's Hall of Residence there. And once I've told the story, I'll offer some thoughts about what it all means. How historians have understood people like Fry, Sidgwick, and Rackstraw has changed over time, and their own archives don't allow us to draw any definitive once and for all conclusions about whether they were or weren't lesbian or queer, or whether the kinds of desires and intimate relationships they have look like the kinds of desires or intimate relationships we imagine as constitutive of being lesbian today. But, I'll argue, whether Fry, Sidgwick, and Rackstraw meant to live queer lives or not, the life paths they carved out for themselves and for other women at odds with the imperatives of marriage and reproduction, the family and kinship structures they created, are and should be central to what we mean when we talk about queer history. Okay, so our story starts at Somerville College in 1894 when Marjorie Fry arrived to read maths. Fry was from a very wealthy Quaker family, her grandfather had made a fortune as a chocolate manufacturer, and her father was a judge, and she grew up in London. Fry's brothers went to Cambridge, but her parents did not believe in higher education for women. It took years of steady campaigning for Fry to convince her parents to allow her to attend Somerville, though they insisted that she not sit any exams concerned about the effect that the stress might have on her health. Somerville in the 1890s was a pivotal place and time in the history of women's higher education in Britain. Only 15 years old in 1894, the college had quickly established itself as both a safe and a respectable place for upper middle class parents to send their daughters, and as the nation's premier academic institution for intelligent and highly educated women with ambition. At Somerville, students adhered to strict norms of propriety and respectability. They had to attend lectures with a chaperone, they could not socialize with men's students, but they were taught by the very best tutors and were encouraged to have the highest aspirations for their careers and for the contributions that they might make to wider society. As compared to women students at other UK universities at this time, Somerville women tended to come from especially well-off and socially prominent backgrounds, and they, attend, and they tended accordingly to perceive themselves to have a noblesse oblige responsibility to dedicate their lives to the good of society. Having pursued haphazard and winding roads through education, at a time when girls' formal academic secondary education was still sparse, many were older than the average men Oxford students, well into their 20s at the time they began their degrees and already moving beyond the typical age of marriage for women. Fry was 20 at the time she started university, and her closest friends were 22 and 27. What work they would do, how they would make the best use of their social and educational advantages, and how they would give purpose and meaning to their lives was of central concern to them. In letters to each other in the years after they completed their studies, Fry and her friends discussed lofty ambitions. The law, politics, research academia, all remarkable aspirations in a time when women did not have the vote, could not read for the bar, and Fry's parents hadn't even let her take the exams that would qualify her to be a school teacher or pursue graduate study. Though their ideas ranged widely, one career that Fry and her friends never <coughs> considered was marriage. In the 1890s, almost 90% of all British women married at some point in their lives, but only 30% of women university graduates did. For middle-class women at this time, formal paid employment and marriage were considered mutually exclusive. It was not considered respectable for middle-class women to work outside the home. Many employers imposed formal marriage bars that required women to resign their positions upon marriage. And, on the other side of the coin, it was those women who did not have husbands who most needed to earn their own living. To be sure, there were increasing opportunities in this period for married women to assume vocations outside the home, whether through volunteer work, political and social activism, 
working together with their husbands in a family business or a common intellectual project. But by focusing their aspirations on professional careers, Fry and her friends were by definition removing marriage and, therefore, children from the life possibilities open to them. For some, this was merely an unfortunate byproduct of pursuing a career, for others, the central attraction. But in either case, they became creative, crafting their own net networks of intimacy, love, and care. After she left Somerville, Fry had been languishing at home, enduring a difficult relationship with her parents and struggling to work out what she might do with her life, when the principal of Somerville offered her a job as the college librarian. She jumped at the chance to escape from her parents' house, and in addition to superintending the design and construction of a new library building, she developed a rich social and professional life in Oxford. After the new library opened, Fry needed help running it, and she gained a new colleague, Rose Sidgwick, history tutor and assistant librarian. Sidgwick was three years younger than Fry, the eldest child of an Oxford academic. Though both Sidgwick and Fry were from affluent intellectual backgrounds, Sidgwick had grown up in an environment much more supportive of women's education and careers. Her father was one of the most vocal and hardworking advocates of women's education in Oxford. She had received an excellent secondary education, lived at home through university, received first-class results in her history examinations, and taught at a teacher training college before joining Somerville in 1903. Now we only have Sidgwick's letters to Fry, not the other way around. There is much we do not know about the internal content of their relationship and how they made sense of what they were to one another, a question with which Sidgwick herself sought to grapple. In an undated poem written in honor of Fry's birthday, Sidgwick wrote that she struggled with how to express her feelings for Fry when, quote, to talk of love does not interest you. The rest of the poem switches back and forth between the language of friend and lover. Take your will, the speaker says about the terminology. Yet, reading through Sidgwick's letters to Fry, a picture emerges of the two women's physical and emotional intimacy, and of a bond unlike their connections to other friends and family. Sidgwick's letters address Fry as dearest, expressing pain when they are apart and a desire to be reunited. In one 1906 letter, Sidgwick says that she cannot quite find the right words to express how she feels about Fry, quote, except by saying that 24 hours of you gives me a clearer and wider perception of what is meant by Christianity. Nor was this only a disembodied spiritual friendship. In a letter in which Sidgwick told Fry about a time when she went skinny dipping while on holiday, she wrote, quote, I thought at that time that you would like me better if you'd seen me splashing there with nothing on. Above all, Sidgwick's expressions of love were playful and open-hearted. She signed one letter, quote, yours that loves you more every day so that I don't know where we shall be in 1950, R.S. And we'll find out by the end of this talk where Sidgwick and Fry were in 1950. <laughs> but first, the next step in their careers, a step they took together. Shortly after the new Somerville Library opened, Fry applied for and received a job as the inaugural warden of University House, the first woman's hall of residence at the University of Birmingham. Though there had been a technical college in Birmingham for decades, in 1900 work had begun on a new planned campus in the leafy suburb of Edgbaston, Britain's first red brick and first campus university. Gender integration had always been central to the vision for Birmingham. The university was headed by progressive administrators who sought to offer the same academic opportunities to women as to men, while still recognizing that women pursuing higher education in this period needed distinct forms of support. While almost half of women university students outside of Oxford and Cambridge in this period lived at home and commuted, others lived too far away and would not be able to attend university unless they could access safe, respectable accommodation and welfare support designed with women students specifically in mind. Fry was 30 when she accepted the university house job and she saw it as a fork in the road. Two years previous, she had turned down a proposal of marriage from an Oxford clergyman and academic. By moving to Birmingham, she perceived herself to be firmly and finally leaving behind the possibility of marrying and having children, instead devoting herself to a life of work that would, she hoped, be socially useful as well as personally satisfying. And her first step in this regard was to turn being a warden into a profession. The first generation of wardens of women's halls have been respectable widows who saw their role as keeping house and chaperoning the young women in their care. Sometimes they even re refused payment as beneath their dignity. Fry, by contrast, only accepted the job on the condition that she would be able to advise students academically and guide their intellectual development. She negotiated a higher salary and a seat on the University Senate. 
As the students came, Fry undertook to get to know each one personally, finding out about her academic interests and life aspirations. She treated them as adults, replacing long lists of rules with a general injunction to respect one's fellow residents and permitting a fairly wide degree of social interaction with men students. The year after Fry started at Birmingham, Sidgwick followed. She was hired as a history lecturer, one of the first women in the UK to gain an academic position that was also open to men applicants. Though it's tempting also to think of her and Fry as having cleverly solved the so-called two-body problem that bedevils academic couples to this day. She moved into University House too, as did other women administrators and faculty, a philosophy lecturer, two French teaching assistants, a bursar, a deputy warden. Most of the faculty had been educated in the Oxford and Cambridge Women's Colleges, and they drew on what they had learned there about how to craft residential educational communities. They prized academic success, but also fun. Amateur dramatics were a particular focus of their efforts. They established a JCR and encouraged student self-governance within it, but also prized faculty participation in extracurricular life and easy relations between staff and students. In her first term, seeking to get what was at the time a chilly and distant community to relate to one another as friends, Fry led the hall's residence in making a snowman in the likeness of the vice chancellor. Candid photographs from the early years of University House show students posing informally, laughing and smiling, offering a glimpse of the culture of this community. In their early years, women's colleges and halls advertised themselves as families. Somerville's first advertising brochure had called it an English family. Lady Margaret Hall, not to be outdone, advertised itself as a Christian family. <laughs> to 20th century feminist historians, this family language signified the unsatisfying compromises that pioneers of women's education had had to make in order to gain a tenuous foothold on hostile ground. A family seemed to signify the families of origin, whom so many women like Fry had defied in order to pursue higher education and professional work. But I think to dismiss so quickly talk of family as regressive risks blinding us to the ways that University House was a family. It was not a normative Victorian nuclear family headed by a stern Christian patriarch and organized around the male breadwinner ideal, but it was a wide extended family, a space of domesticity, informality, friendship, and fun. It had pets, a dog joined the household early on, benevolent uncles in the form of the university's senior male administrators who dropped in unannounced for dinner, and a commitment to treating everyone from the domestic staff to distinguished visitors with respect, if not reverence. It had a younger generation in the form of the students whose personal and professional development Fry, Sidgwick, and her colleagues guided, and it had an older generation comprising several resident senior members. Though, I want to suggest, Fry's and Sidgwick's dyadic relationship was at its center, the heart of what made University House a family and a home. And to explore this further, we need to take the story forward a few years into the upheaval brought about by the First World War. At the end of the 1913-14 academic year, Fry had resigned as warden. Having inherited money from the family chocolate fortune, she felt that it would be unethical also to draw a salary, and she intended to enter local politics. She and Sidgwick rented a house together, while Sidgwick continued teaching at Birmingham. But when Britain entered the war in August 1914, plans changed. Fry joined the Quaker war relief effort, camping just behind the lines of the Western Front, providing food parcels, first aid, and childcare to French refugees whose villages had been destroyed. She inspired several University House students to follow her example. But Citric stayed behind, supervising University House's move into rented accommodation after the War Office requisitioned their building. Citric struggled with guilt at remaining in Birmingham. Most of her friends had taken up war work, and her youngest brother Hugh, to whom she was close, was an army captain. The letters she exchanged with Fry while the latter was in France were filled with uncertainty. Fry, writing shortly after arriving in France in the spring of 1915, expressed anxiety about, quote, the vagueness and vastness of what I have to do, and wished Sidgwick could come to France to reassure her that what she was doing was useful. Sidgwick's letters are those of the partner who has been left behind. Quote, darling, I am thankful you are not a soldier fighting, she wrote in 1915. A 1917 letter accompanied a parcel including home comforts such as powdered shampoo. In the letter, Sidgwick wondered if she and other University House staff should simply shut the hostel for the duration of the war and all join Fry in France. 
Throughout their wartime correspondence, both Fry and Sidrick wrote of the difficulty of not being able to talk to each other or to be close to one another, of the limits of what can be said in a letter. Though Fry was not a soldier fighting, she was still enduring discomfort and danger, and she and Sidgwick figured their relationship in the paradigm of couples torn asunder by the conflagration. There was an unspoken tension, too, it seems, in their language, as they worked through challenging moral questions about whether they and their friends and family were doing enough or the right kind of work. So one of Fry's closest friends, a Birmingham math lecturer, was killed in action in 1916. And in 1917, Citric's brother Hugh was also killed. Citric and her sisters became close to Hugh's fiance, adopting her as part of their family as they mourned together. Both Fry and Citric were devastated by these losses and struggled to ascertain what each other were truly feeling and how best to support each other. But Citric found a new source of meaning in imagining that the war might in indirectly enact progressive political change. Drawing on her background as a historian, she lectured on internationalism for the Workers' Educational Association and the League of Nations Union. She wrote to Fry with a renewed sense of optimism about the conversations she was having with other internationalists in Birmingham. Quote, with the suffrage and Russia on the way to freedom and some hope of a League of Nations, one can't help seeing that something has come out of these three black years. An opportunity to contribute to the internationalist cause came in summer 1918 when the Foreign Office invited Fry to join a British educational mission to the United States. Since the war had foreclosed the possibility of academic collaboration with Germany for both British and American academics, the British and US governments saw an opportunity to use universities to strengthen a strategic bond with one another. Fry was to join six other academics and university administrators on a four-month tour of dozens of US colleges and universities promoting awareness of the UK higher education sector and opportunities for international collaboration in research and teaching. Fry had returned from France nine months previous, but her father was dying and she was needed to support her family of origin. She suggested that Sidgwick go to America in her stead. Sidgwick hesitated at first, but the trip was an unmissable opportunity. She scrambled to find people to cover her teaching for the autumn 1918 term, and set sail alongside the mission's other woman delegate, Bedford College English professor Caroline Spurgeon. At the dock in New York, they were met by their American host, Dean of Barnard College, Virginia Gildersleeve, who was at that time the US's most prominent woman university administrator. Sidgwick Spurgeon and their five male colleagues had an ambitious itinerary. They were feted everywhere they went with ample opportunity to revel in their newfound celebrity status. Sidgwick's and Spurgeon's schedule was especially hectic necessitating squeezing extra visits to women's colleges in among the main itinerary of men's and co-educational institutions and involving a bevy of high society invitations in Boston, New York, and Washington. They also addressed countless non-academic women's organizations from social clubs to suffrage campaigns. Despite the challenges of the trip, Citric's travel diary shows the excitement with which she greeted the new information she was gleaning about life for women students in the US. She found the campuses delightful heavenly and jolly. She celebrated the resources Americans were willing to dedicate to higher education, their state-of-the-art facilities and spacious campuses. While all this was happening, an unusually virulent strain of influenza was circulating in the United States. It had arisen in 1917, probably somewhere in the American Midwest or in Western Europe. As soldiers demobilized at the end of the war, they carried it around the world. It infect, infected 500 million people globally and killed as many as 100 million, 6% of the global population, most of them healthy young adults. Spurgeon and Sidgwick both came down with influenza while visiting New York. Spurgeon recovered quickly, but Sidgwick became critically ill. She was admitted to the Columbia University Hospital, where she spent over two weeks before dying on 28 December 1918. No one had thought to tell Fry that Sidgwick was even ill. She learned of Citric's death on the 1st of January when Citric's sister Ethel sent her a telegram, four days later after an obituary had already run in the New York Tribune. Fry felt consumed with survivor's guilt, feeling as if, in having nominated Citric for the trip in her stead, it was all her fault. She was also angry that no one had told her that she had been unable to send Citric a telegram saying that she loved her before she died. Though no one from the UK was able to travel to New York for the funeral, Ethel came a few months later to see Sidrick's grave and order a headstone. 
Fry could only pack up Sidgwick's belongings to send to her family of origin and vacate their house in Birmingham. She moved to London, asking a friend to come sit with her in the last hours before leaving Birmingham, because being alone in the empty house was, quote, un unbearable. Despite these ways in which, in death, Sidgwick's and Fry's relationship was denied recognition, there were paradigms available with which Fry could make sense of her loss. In 1918, countless people across all levels of society had lost loved ones, as, of course, had Fry and Sidgwick themselves a couple years earlier. And Sidgwick had, after all, been on a diplomatic mission in aid of the war effort. At the High Church Anglican funeral in the Columbia University Chapel, her coffin was draped in a Union Jack, and the pallbearers included senior diplomats, politicians, and American university administrators. The Women Academics American host, Virginia Gildersleeve, later recalled, quote, I felt that she had died as truly in the service of her country as had the thousands of her young countrymen who had fallen on the fields of Flanders and of France. Fry echoed this comparison, writing to her mother about her regret that she could not have been at Sidgwick's side as she lay ill. She said, quote, of course, it's what happened to all those soldiers. If Sidgwick was a soldier, that gave Fry a script through which she could participate in a kind of collective mourning alongside those who had also lost lovers and partners in the war. She wrote Sidgwick's official obituary and had printed a collection of Sidgwick's poetry and speeches that she could send to former students and other well-wishers. And also, Sidgwick is one of two women who is listed on the war memorial at the University of Birmingham, you know, that records the men who died in action during the First World War. Um, and we know that Fry must have saved Sidgwick's papers, including the love letters and poetry Sidgwick sent to her and the travel diary she kept in the US, because those papers today are kept at Somerville, forever interleaved among Fry's own. The faculty and alumni of University House created a small memorial garden in Sidgwick's honor. Although University House is now part of the business school at Birmingham, the garden is still there. For the rest of her life, Fry would send money for its upkeep. Though Fry's and Sidgwick's relationship ended prematurely and in tragedy, it had some important legacies. One was a transnational network of women academics, united under the internationalist principles that Sidgwick had sought to further. Sidgwick's colleague Caroline Spurgeon and their host Virginia Gildersleeve themselves entered into what was to become a 24-year domestic <coughs> partnership, and they became the founders and first presidents of the International Federation of University Women, an organization that, most, that mostly organized international fellowship and study abroad programs, but that believed highly educated women were uniquely positioned to solve international relations' most intractable problems. One of the organization's first acts was to establish a Rose Sidgwick Memorial Fellowship, for a British woman to pursue an exchange year or graduate study in the US. The IFUW had world historical objectives, but arguably more important and lasting were Fry's and Sidgwick's legacies closer to home. The family of University House was not a biological one, but in its own way, it produced children. One such child was Marjorie Rackstraw, who came to Birmingham in 1908 to study history and joined the community at University House. She adopted her history lecturer and the hall's warden as her aunts. When she pursued an exchange year in the US after taking her degree, Sidgwick and Fry wrote her joint letters, addressing her as dearest niece. In 1913, Rackstraw came back to University House as bursar, but on the outbreak of war, she followed Fry's example and devoted herself to Quaker war relief, despite not having a Quaker background herself. Returning in 1924 from her work to, excuse me, returning in 1924 from her work helping famine victims in Russia, she took up the position of warden at Masson Hall, the University of Edinburgh's first hall of residence for women. Here, too, Rackstraw learned from her aunt's example, working to revolutionize the role of the warden within the university ecosystem. In her hiring negotiations, she secured a higher salary, a promise to hire an assistant warden, and a vote on relevant university committees. Within six months of beginning her work, she developed a new financial plan for the hall that would allow for expansion, and in a critical statement of the role's professionalization, she secured membership in the Federated Superannuation Scheme for Universities, the 10-year-old National Pension Scheme for University staff, for all the staff in the room, the 100-year uh, history of university pensions, uh, which continue to resonate. Um, as at University House, the culture that pertained among mass and staff and students was not only informal, but took a modern approach to supervision of the hall's residents that recognized that they were adults and that the war had altered expectations for middle-class young women's behavior. Rackstraw's scrapbooks include annual group portraits of the hall's residents, 
arranged in rows, but candidly, smiling and laughing with their arms around each other. Dogs and babies appear in some of these photos, telegraphing the sense that Matson was a home for students, resident faculty, and domestic staff. Rackstall remained warden at Masson until 1937, when she was 49. Like Fry, she inherited some money that meant she could pursue volunteer work and local politics instead. Like Fry, she moved to London. While Fry continued to have an illustrious public career as a distinguished prison reform advocate, higher education administrator, and public intellectual, Rackstraw worked closer to home, serving as a labor member of the London County Council and advocating in particular for the needs of the elderly. In 1968, a Hampstead Housing Association that had built a new block of flats for older people wanted to name it after Ragstraw. By this time 80 years old, she initially resisted, but she relented because she realized that it was a way to pass on her family name. The flats still stand on Primrose Hill Road. There are many kinds of children. Some are council flats made of red brick. After the Second World War, Fry became a popular contributor on the BBC at a time when few women's voices were heard on the radio. <coughs> On Tuesday, the 2nd of December, 1952, at 9.55 p.m., she presented a talk on the home service entitled The Single Woman. Proposing to speak as a spinster to spinsters, Fry radically spoke openly of the pain and loneliness of going without marriage, by implication, without having sexual fulfillment, and without children, of, quote, simply watching all the things taken for granted in other lives passing you by. 78 years old when she delivered this talk, this sense of having fundamentally missed out is how Fry chose to characterize the entire sweep of her life. Coming across the transcript of this talk in Fry's papers challenged the view I had built up from the rest of her archival record. It pushed me to rethink the reading I had developed of her life outside of marriage as entirely freely chosen and of her relationship with Sidgwick as for her equivalent to, or perhaps even better than, an opposite sex marriage recognized by church and state. It also pushed me to look again at, and really to see, the intimacies with men that she had enjoyed throughout her life. Her courtship with the Oxford academic when she was at Somerville, her close friendship with the Birmingham mathematician who'd been killed in the war. How Fry narrated her own life, at least from this retrospective moment in the 1950s, challenges certainly any simplistic reading of it as a story of queer fulfillment and self-actualization. The real pain in her language at having missed out on something she truly wanted is not only an expression of social ostracization due to having an unconventional lifestyle, it's an authentic assertion that her life did not afford her the precise kinds of intimacies and relationships that she desired. So where does this leave us? I'd like to close this story with three morals. Moral the first is about what academic queer history actually is. As the British queer historian Laura Doan has written, queer history is a method, not an object of study, I think. It's a lens through which to view indeterminacies and irregularities, those elements of lives, communities, and feelings that seem, in the original meaning of the word queer, slightly askew. Queer history is what allows us to apprehend how Fry thought about herself as a lifelong single woman. It's what allows us to leave suspended and unresolved the question of whether and how Sidgwick's and Fry's relationship was erotic or sexual, it's what allows us to cautiously situate Sidgwick, Fry, and Rackstraw alongside others in their time and place who lived lives against and outside of marriage and the nuclear family. Academic queer history seeks precisely not to come down on one side or another of the were they or weren't they question. As the preeminent queer theorist Eve Sedgwick wrote in 1994, quote, that's one of the things that queer can refer to. The open mesh of possibilities, gaps, overlaps, dissonances and resonances, lapses and excesses of meaning when the constituent elements of anyone's gender, of anyone's sexuality, aren't made or can't be made to signify monolithically. But the project of queer history can also respect and sit alongside the many ways that we, historians or not, construct our own folk genealogies of gender and sexual minority communities, finding echoes and resonances, at times surprising ones, in the lives of those long dead. Queer history is not in the business of denying people the personal meaning they might derive from relating to historical actors, but it is in the business of asking different, and I hope in some ways more sophisticated and less satisfying questions. So moral the second, that was moral the first, moral the second is, in opposition to everything I just said about queer history, 
presentist, and it is political. Since the 1970s, gay and queer politics have been about so much more than staking a claim for the validity of congenital same-sex sexual object choice. Central, among other things, to the demands of radical gay and queer activists has been a critique of the nuclear family as the primary site of affective bonding and personal loyalty. Gay and queer people often experience rejections from their families of origin and have often not had their most important relationships recognized by the state, religious institutions, or society. Out of this has emerged the space to imagine other possibilities. We don't need to read people in the past as having had dyadic monogamous romantic partnerships in order to appreciate possibilities for more multivalent stories about intimacy and connection. Fry's Life is a story about at least one dyadic partnership, but also about a strained but ongoing committed relationship to her family of origin, about other close friendships with women and with men, about protégés like Marjorie Rackstraw who became family too. My point in saying this is to ask us, if we think back to the meme with which I began this talk, to take the just out of just good friends, and to appreciate what the gay philosopher Michel Foucault called friendship as a way of life, as central to the queer political project. To call people in the past good friends should not be to minimize their relationship, but rather to celebrate the many ways people have found connection and community with one another, often in the face of oppressive social and political structures. And finally, Marl the Third. I'd like to suggest that it's no accident that the story of queer history, community, intimacy, and chosen family that I've told today took place within the context of universities. Ever since the oldest European universities were established as religious foundations whose members were expected to conform to clerical celibacy, residential higher education has afforded possibilities for family and community life beyond or outside of marriage and biological reproduction. For centuries, residential collegiate life has offered a refuge to those who could not or did not want to marry, and has also offered a way for those who could not or did not want to have children of their own to concern themselves with the care of the young. The queer story I want to leave you with today is not only that of Fry's and Sidgwick's relationship, but that of their care for their student, Marjorie Rackstraw, who followed her adoptive aunt's example and became a warden just like them. The end. Um, we do have some time for questions now, so if anybody has anything that they would like to ask, please do go ahead. Thanks, Daya. <laughs> <laughs> this is my student. Yeah. Hi. Um, <laughs> so much for a really interesting talk. Um, I was really interested in the question of agency mm -hmm. that you brought up, um, especially to do with um, how nuanced it must be, especially when you go to regret, mm -hmm. almost. Mm -hmm. um, how, as like queer historians, and we sort of kind of negotiate the element of agency, because obviously it's so central to feminist political yeah. Yeah. as well. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think for me, it is kind of about not resolving that question, uh, which I sort of tried to do here. Uh, and, uh, you know, we don't know, right? Like, we also, like, so it's about kind of not resolving the question because we don't know whether Fry, if she could have had it her way, like what she would have chosen, right? I mean, we know that at one moment in her life, she made a certain series of decisions, and then 50 years later, she felt differently about her life, or she felt a way about her life that experienced regret, or you know, was sort of contrasted with the decisions that she made. Um, what we don't know is, I mean, it's impossible to imagine. What would Marjorie Fry do if she were alive today? Because she's not alive today, right? Like, if she didn't live the life of a 21st century person, you know, uh, she, could not have conception. We, you know, we can't say, oh, well, if Fry and Citric lived today, they would have gotten married, right? Because she couldn't have conceptualized a world in which marriage was a non, definitionally non-heterosexual institution, right? She conceived of a world that had the institution of marriage and that had various life possibilities that you could live outside of marriage, right? Um, and so 
you know, thinking of Fry's and Sidgwick's relationship as the same thing as a lesbian relationship today just doesn't compete because they didn't live today, right? They lived 100 years ago. Um, and so I think for me, the historical question is, like, how do we understand how they made sense of the choices that were available to them at the time? Uh, and what does that tell us about the time, right? Um, which is a different question to saying, like, I identify with this person, I relate to this person, I, you know, connect with them in some way when I learn about their story, right? Um, yeah. And the good thing is, like, she, I mean, in terms of agency, right, she's an incredibly elite, like, wealthy, well-positioned person, right? You know, this is not someone who's being denied agency in most ways in her life, right? Yeah. Story, like, I think I'm kind of conservative on this, like, and I don't want to speculate beyond what's available in the sources, or I only want to speculate in certain ways. Um, and I think I just have like a knee jerk reaction against kind of putting a presentist reading onto this sort of situation and going too far in the other direction in some ways. Uh, but that's not the only valid historical approach to take, and there are lots of like historians who have speculated really, or written really sensitively about how to interpret archival silences and how to um, sort of think imaginatively about archival sources. Uh, and I think, and, and also to like use the past in the service of, you know, sort of more presentist political projects. And I think it's partly my own kind of subject, I don't know, but instinct subjectivity, like, that I tend not to do that, but let a thousand flowers bloom, you know. Yeah. Um, so, the kind of second more point you said about getting rid of the just yeah. Friend, um, yeah. immediate friend, I was sort of wondering how you sort of square that with the sort of just good friends as being a way to kind of enact sort of queer erasure and kind of get yeah. rid of that, like, how do you yeah. Because I, I really appreciate them the being good friends. Yeah. But. Yeah, and so like the way that I read them, and maybe you read them differently. Yeah. Maybe we all read them differently. I don't know. But like, the way that I read them mean is like, uh, you know, historians, historians, the villainous force historians, <laughs> use the label good friends to deny the existence of a gay relationship or a queer relationship. Um, and I, what I'm trying to say is, Good friends can be queer too, right? They don't have to be lesbians for us to understand their lives as queer and as part of queer history because uh, they live lives in opposition to the imperatives of reproduction, heteronormativity, the nuclear family, which were all the things that gay liberation critiqued, right? Like, demand one in the American gay liberation movement is abolish the nuclear family. Um, it's not let the gays get married, right? <laughs> like, you know, we've gone on whatever path that we've gone on, but that was not what 1970s gay activists wanted us to do, right? Um, and so I think if we take seriously the political project of 1970s gay activists, right, it means recognizing that there's something, I mean, these are not like very radical people, right? The bourgeois liberals are independently wealthy. They work in universities at a time when 2% of the population went to university, right? Like, you know, but in some ways they're doing something that's quietly radical or in opposition to norms, and they're living sort of gender and sexuality lives that are in opposition to norms, therefore they are part of queer history. Um, even though, like A, the archive doesn't tell us whether they were lesbian, and B, it, doesn't, it tells us that they weren't because they had that word available to them and didn't use it. Uh, you know, they chose not to think of themselves in that kind of um, medicalizing, sort of pathologizing paradigm. Uh, and also because they're sort of an older generation and that label's kind of arising when they're already in late middle age and, you know, it's not kind of the work they came up in. Um, but they can still be, you know, 
that they don't, we don't have to say, oh, they're just like lesbians today in order to consider them part of queer history because what was important about them exists on its own terms and doesn't have to be reduced to that. And it's not dismissing them to say, well, they actually didn't consider themselves lesbians, right? They understood their intimacy and friendships and partnerships in other terms. Uh, yeah, back in the back of yeah, uh, thank you for the talk. I just have one basic question on are there any working class counterparts on similar stories? Oh, that's a good question, yeah. Um, so there's a really, the first thing that comes to mind for me is there's a really interesting book called The Match Girl and the Heiress by Seth Coben, um, which is about uh, oh, like a relationship or a sort of intimate friendship between um, a woman kind of like this and a working class woman. Um, uh, and the, the woman, the sort of elite woman is a manager of a kind of um, Christian a settlement house, a kind of Christian social reform project in the East End of London in the 1880s and 1890s. And um, she, Coben suggests, forms this sort of really intimate friendship with a woman who is one of the people that the settlement house is supposed to be helping and who gets a job working in the house. And um, so it's this kind of world, sort of professional women's community, but it also has this kind of cross-class relationship that's part of it. And Coven kind of analyzes the language of their friendship and intimacy and sort of how they understood their relationship. And he's got kind of a rosy picture about it, right? I think he wants them to be in love with each other and, <laughs> you know, like doesn't, like sometimes turns a blind eye to the ways that there's sort of problematic hierarchies of class in their relationship. But it, it's, I mean, it's interesting because it can't help but center class as an analytic because the whole point of these women's relationship is and the sort of circumstances in which they met each other in this social reform project. So that's like a really interesting way to explore very, very similar themes to this, but in a kind of class context. Yeah. Yeah. Why did you write about the hierarchy? Because it looks as he's like the Trump phrase for the era in terms of centuries. How do you retry to put yourself in your own shoes? Um, their relationship, there's something that's like, it's really, you know, maybe I should say this earlier, right? This is a really legible category of relationship to their contemporaries, right? Two professional middle to upper middle class women who live together and keep house together at Spencer's. This is an incredibly legible, unproblematic, like, social formation. Um, you know, and many of their friends and colleagues and family members recognize that they mean something to each other that's different to their other friendships. Like when Sidwick dies, you know, the people who like to cry and send our condolences, right? They recognize that they are writing to the partner of somebody who has died, right? Um, and they, you know, they say, we can't imagine how you must be feeling in your loss. Like, we know how much Sidwick meant to you. Like, it's that kind of language, right? Um, and yeah, there, there's nothing to hide. It's not illegal, also, right? Like, and, uh, you know, important, right? Sex between women was never criminalized in Britain. Um, there's nothing to be blackmailed about. We, we, you know, we don't know how physical their relationship was or in what ways it was physical. That's not a question I'm very interested in because I'm interested more in the emotional side um, in this case. Uh, but I think that, you know, so that's not sort of what I do is I try to understand, well, what were the norms at the time? What was the society at the time? In what ways did they exist in the kind of social formations and possibilities that they exist in? Well, how did they make sense of what they wanted and what the directions their lives went in? in the context of the options that were available to them as highly educated middle to upper middle class women who wanted to pursue a career like in 1900, you know? Um, and, and part of that is they found this way of existing outside of, you know, heterosexual marriage that was actually relatively normalized. But then the thing is that what happens is that sort of, let's put the water glass down for this. <laughs> as, the, as the category, as, this is what I argue in my book, as heterosexuality becomes more dominant as a way of men and women interacting with each other, which it does as sort of norms get more relaxed. It's more like, you know, you're a young woman, you can go out dating and go to the man 
events and movies and like, you know, young people, but after the First World War, young people are like really socializing in this heterosexual paradigm. And it gives them, women, young women like this because it gives them a set of rules for how to relate to men, right? So there's many fewer restrictions around men and women socializing together, but they like to sort of go do couplesy activities where a woman can say, no, thank you, I don't want to dance. And then it gives you a sort of a clear script for how to manage that kind of cross-gender interaction that would often be sort of safe and unsafe and threatening, right? Sorry, this is such a tangent from your actual question. <laughs> but so as this like heterosexual paradigm becomes the main way that men, young men and women interact with each other, it marginalizes all these other possibilities for kind of navigating adult life as a woman. And it starts to become increasingly weird for you to not be having sexual relationships with men, right? The sort of the idea of the frigid or repressed woman becomes more a kind of criticism. Uh, and this kind of spinster-like trajectory. The other thing that's happening in this period is that the feminist movement is like fighting for women to be able to combine family and career as a feminist demand, which obviously that still really resonates today. It's something that we still talk about as a really important kind of feminist like talking point. Uh, and they're quite successful at that. They abolish some of these marriage bars, you know, that are sort of creating this dichotomy between marriage and career. Um, but then it becomes weird if you're a professional woman who doesn't have a husband, right? And so what's happening as this norm of heterosexuality is becoming ever more pervasive, these alternative possibilities that, as I said, are like really legible and normal in the 1890s, right? By the 1930s are like bizarre and pathologized and, you know, uh, marginalized, right? And then what's also happening at the same time, the late 20s, early 30s, is there's some sort of high profile scandals about lesbians, like the Well Loneliness and Obscenity trial, that are kind of driving this more medicalized understanding of what a lesbian is into the public eye. And again, like pathologizing and marginalizing women who don't conform to this heterosexual norm. Um, so that's something that changes over the course of Fry's and Stitcher's life. And as I, I suggest in my book, that's part of why, by the 1950s, Fry thinks that she's fundamentally screwed up her life because she hasn't gotten married and had a family, right? The, the kind of social formation that she existed very unproblematically in in the 1890s, 1900s, 1910s just doesn't exist anymore. And she can't conceive of that as like a fulfilling and like sensible life path to have, right? Um, but that's all sort of very unfamiliar from our present, right? So it's not that I think about what would I do if I was in their situation. I think what would they do if they were in their situation, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think my impulse would be to say that it happens organically. You know, that's the thing about you know, history is like the study of contingency, right? And you don't really know how it's going to turn out, and you sort of zoom in at a particular moment, and then you know, from the historical actor's point of view, they are not time that travelers. They don't know what's in the future, right? We know that we have the, that sort of privileged position, but um, you know, I, I guess I think a good example, maybe, of them sort of any of them kind of consciously wanting to leave a legacy is the moment where Rackstraw says like, oh yeah, you know what, I guess you can name the building after me um, because, you know, I'm 80 and I don't have anyone else to sort of pass my name on to and I'm a little bit embarrassed about this, we have to go have a ceremony for it and like show up, but actually I think it would be quite nice to have something that lives on with my name on it. I find that really moving actually. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I guess that's an example of someone sort of consciously making a choice to leave a legacy. But I think for most of them, it was kind of contingent, and they were trying to do, you know, they were trying to make a difference, they were trying to do something that was meaningful, and try to, they were, you know, the they were really tortured by the, like a lot of these kind of really elite, highly educated women who had had a ton of opportunities. They knew how elite they were, they knew how privileged they were, and they were really tortured by the idea of like, needing to do the most good with the opportunities that they had. So like when Fry, you know, when she's in at Somerville and she's talking to her friends and they're like, what are we gonna, how are we gonna give back? How are we gonna use these opportunities that so few women have had and that we have only had because our family's really reasonably supportive and really well off and, you know, we have a responsibility to do good. And they often try to like come up with the most selfless ways that they can do good. 
And in some ways, like Fry and her friends, like a lot of them take a more reasonable path, which is like, you know, how can we do good with the particular skills that we have instead of merely being self-sacrificial, right? Um, but it's something that, that they really, they take really, really seriously. Uh, and, uh, you know, really, yeah, really take a lot of consideration too. Thanks, Mr. Yeah, thank you so much.